I would like to start uh, with the, with you with some of the things that is happening um, right now on the global economy, what's happened with remittances. I can see from the pool that the majority of your participating have received remittances, have sent remittances, or have, a, have to know what is remittances. So why is remittances so important? If we talk about development and we talk about different issues, as you have been seen in the in the previous presentations and yesterday during the day, migration is it's a contentious sometimes issue, but the most tangible way of looking at the migration is remittances. Migrants who leave the country send back home remittances, and this is a very good help for the countries. It's a good help at three levels. At the macro level, because it helps the country on the foreign exchange and the balance of payment. It's a good for the families who receive the remittances at the household level, at the micro level. Now, I'm going to start my presentation to mention what happened with the remittances during the COVID-19 and, and what is going on right now in the international markets. As you know, and you were aware, remittances uh, uh, last year, on the last 18 months, have been a very tremendous year for everybody due to the COVID-19, with a lot of the lockdown measures, with a lot of impact on employment, with a lot of impact at the global trade. Everything has impacted the world, and we have seen some of the issues coming on that. So I'm going to discuss with you a little bit my three uh, I, I hope that you can see the presentation. Let's see if it's moving. Perfect. The key message of the presentation. The key message that I'm going to give you on the presentation are going to be remittances. Remittances flows proved to be resilient during COVID-19 crisis. After all the um, after all the flows, the trade were impacted, the travel restrictions were imposed, and a lot of family a lot of uh, families lost their work. Remittances during 2020 were, were not decreased as much as we were expected when it was the lockdown. They decreased only by 1.6% in 2020. They are expected to grow during this year. A little bit more, it, we have calculated 2.6 in 2021, but for some countries are going to be, it's growing, uh, uh, it's a recovery now, and they're growing a little bit more. However, as you can see, with the new Delta variants and with the new variants that are coming, there are some risks that the uh, that downside risk that they maybe the remittances were impacted. However, we have seen that global remittances are needed to keep remittances flowing and to help migrants uh, uh, to, to help migrants in, and included them also in the COVID-19 policy responses. You have been seeing, I don't know if there has been some discussions. I, I think in the yesterday you were having some discussions on what happened with the Afghan crisis and all the refugees that are coming from the Afga uh, from Afghanistan to different countries, included in Europe. One of the first measures that, that some of the we were having, we were in a meeting yesterday with some of the agencies working, and one of the first measures is to make sure that the refugee Afghans get vaccinated. No, and they're included in any program that they can be vaccinated in order to protect the whole populations, themselves and the whole population. So as I was mentioning to you, remittances were not impacted. And as you can see from the graph, on the flows that it comes into a country, in the flows around the world, we have the official development assistance flows and we have the foreign direct investment flows. Foreign direct investment has been one of the key international flows coming to a countries and helping the countries. But we saw in 2019 that remittances were higher than foreign direct investment and official development assistance around the world. Now, this we, when this happens, we thought that maybe when the crisis came in 2020 with the COVID-19, remittances were not going to keep it up. But as you can see from the data and for the graph, remittances didn't fall down as much as, for example, foreign direct investment has fallen down. So remittances are still resilient and are very important to support the balance of payments and the foreign exchange of a country. Now, if we don't include 
remittances from China, which is China represents a lot of uh, the, a lot of remittances goes to China. You can see that the remittances are even larger than the foreign direct investment. And you can see how foreign direct investment can uh, has come down in the world in, for different countries. Just to give you an example, these are the remittances that are going to Europe and Central Asia. For Europe and Central Asia with the Slovakia, the Republic of the Slovak Republic is there. Remittances are important and, and are larger than foreign direct investment, even for uh, since 2019, even without the crisis. And it kept keep, keep in, in that way. Official development assistance is very low. So remittances are important for uh, European and Central Asian countries. And this is also for Latin America. This is to show you how is the contrast with other Latin American countries, which they have a huge foreign direct investment because they have a lot of extractive uh, industries, but remittances also are key for them. Just to give you an idea with what happened with the, with the numbers, and um, this is a, a comparison of how remittances have become important along the different uh, years. And I put here in this table the, present, uh, the numbers for the financial crisis in 2009 and the numbers of what happened with the remittances in 2000, uh, in the latest years. And as you can see, the remittances uh, have been in, uh, were highly impacted and even more in the financial crisis in Europe and Central Asia. There was a drop of minus 11.3, which after that, it was very hard to recover even in 2015. Still, there was a, a little bit of a drop. When we reach the 2020, the, the, the decrease has been minus 9.7 for European and Central Asia. And it has been one of the, the, the second largest decrease around the world after uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And we're expecting that they, they're, they're going to recover and the decrease will not be so low, so bad for, the, for, for this year and this coming. Now, who are the top remittances globally? You were expecting which countries are have. In terms of, in terms of volume of remittances, India and China are the largest recipients along with Mexico and Philippines. No, uh, there's no countries in ECA which are the are, are largest recipients of remittances. However, also countries as a percentage of GDP, remittances are an important uh, size. For example, for Lebanon, who is now in a high crisis, 33% of their GDP constitute remittances. And El Salvador is about 24%. When I started working on remittances in 2007, uh, remittances as a, as a percentage of GDP in El Salvador was around 10%. Now, why is, uh, uh, and then for the largest countries, even that for Mexico, remittances as a percentage of the GDP is not so high, remittances is one of the largest components and higher than the income that they receive on oil. Let's continue. So then, I oh know, yeah, it's moved. So for the Europe, uh, Europe and Central Asia countries, as you can see, the largest receiving of remittance is Ukraine, Russia Federation, Uzbekistan. But we can see also Kyrgyz and Georgia, Moldova. For the Kyrgyz and the Tajikistan, remittance represents almost more than a quarter of the GDP. And for the larger countries also, it has a, a more than 10%, Albania, Armenia. So if there's a drop on remittance, it impacts highly the GDP of the country. Not only that the people cannot consume and cannot um, receive the remittances for health, for food, or for education issues, but also remittances help in the balance of payment of a country and helps in the current account of the country. So it's very important for foreign exchange. Just to give some numbers uh, for, um, for the Slovak Republic, they have received remittances, uh, they have been a decrease of almost 9% from 2019 to 2020. And for 2020 estimated it was 1.8 billion. 
And this was a decrease from 2.0 billion that it was in 2018. And for the Slovak Republic, the the remittance represents only 1.8% of the GDP. But despite that, it's still important remittances for the economy of the um, Slovak Republic. And the main sources of countries from where the remittances come for the Slovak Republic, maybe you have guessed uh, from the Czech, Czech Republic, from the United Kingdom, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and Hungary. So these are the main corridors where remittances come for the Slovak Republic. Now, how was the impact? The, as you can see, Europe and Central Asia were highly impacted in, uh, uh, during this COVID crisis. They were negatively and highly impacted, almost 10%, compared to what, what happened in Latin America. Now, there are different explanations on what is happening in other countries and why this happened in Europe. Basically, for Europe, it because it was um, depreciation of the rubble, there are problems with the oil, and there also there was the lockdown on COVID-19. Now, is this true? Does, was this true for the whole year? No, I think uh, we can see, uh, you can see from the numbers very clear that when the lockdown measures started being imposed, like it was around March or April for the majority of the cases, there was a huge drop in remittances because all there was no travel, there was no the remittance service providers couldn't open their services, they couldn't offer or the people cannot pick it up. So we observed in the Q2 a huge drop and this was what we initially were expecting. If the economy was going to be completely closed, remittances were, uh, were dropped in quarter two. However, we did a lot of campaigns, the World Bank and NOMAD, we did a lot of campaigns with different institutions. And um, one of the campaigns that we were proposing, which is the call to actions that we did, is a jointly initiative by the United Kingdom and the, and the Switzerland. And then also our colleagues from IFAD and the World Bank also did another comp campaign to, to call for the importance of call to, uh, call to action on remittances, the importance of declaring remittances service providers, the companies that receive and send remittances to declare them essential services so they can remain open and people can go to these agencies and send money. And this helped a little bit on these, uh, on these things. We also requested, for example, to facilitate the digital, uh, the digital IDs so people can use the digital means. And we have seen that a lot of the remittances are being sent now by digital means because you cannot go now to, when there, there was the lockdown, you cannot go in person to, uh, to, to send the remittances. We see then after the Q2 and Q3 and Q4, there was a recovery in large in a majority of the countries. And if I projected Q1 now for 2021, uh, you will see a larger recovery of the remittances after the lockdown. So we see an up, up, uh, upward trend in the, la in the majority of the countries. We are coming with the new, uh, the new publications in October, so you will see those numbers in that publication. But just to give you a... Um, and a glimpse of what is coming, there's going to be a recovery and then we're seeing that. Now, what has been the reason? You will be asking why, why remittances are resilient. We have seen that remittances are resilient in different situations and especially in situations of crisis. We have seen that they, when there have been natural disasters or when there have been pandemic, the people who have migrated, emigrated to other countries still contribute to their families and they wanted them to be continue receiving the remittances. So this willingness of the migrants to continue to support the families has been seen in this during this COVID-19, despite that they were impacted in their jobs, despite that they were impacted because some of them have contracted uh, COVID on the health issues, remittances uh, remain resilient. Now, 
The second has been the countercyclical fiscal policy in many large host countries. Many large host countries like the United States, in Europe, in different countries, they have been offering counter fiscal policy measures. These counter fiscal policy measures have helped also that the remittances continue because migrants receive these counter fiscal measures. Now, at the beginning, we thought that there were going to be a huge uh, drop on the, grow, uh, on the growth of the countries because the uh, COVID was going to impact the uh, oil, as I mentioned, the trade volumes, the production, the GDP. But at the, on the course of the 2020, we expected, we have a better than expected economic performance in many large host countries. And I will show you some of the, of the, of the numbers. And then finally, why we have not seen so much on the remittances. We have seen that before, remittances were sending largely in cash. And they're still sending largely in cash, but given that the lockdown measures, there was a lot of shift from cash to digital because people cannot carry with them the remittances. They cannot carry when they travel or they cannot send it with other friends' remittances. There was has been a shift from informal to formal channels, especially in the countries that the the money is being, is being sent by informal channels. Just to give you two examples, between Zimbabwe and South Africa, the money is not being sent maybe by the money transfer operators because they, they send the money by bus. They cross the border and they send ma the money by the families. But now we have been a huge shift and increase in remittances due to the better collection by the by, uh, by central banks and also an increase on the use of digital remittances. Now, how long this will last? We see that it is still lasting, but remember, the digital remittances are great, but it's a way to send the formal channels, but certain migrants that are undocumented, they don't have the ID to be sending remittances, or they don't have the knowledge or the financial literacy to send, to use the digital uh, channels. So that it created some problems. And just to give you an example, I send remittances all the time to my family and my friends in Peru, but I used to send it by cash. I go by cash, go to the supermarket, and I send, I did deposit my money, the money is there. Now with the lockdown, I have to use for the first time, send it digital. Digital, which is basically using the web platform and sending it. At the beginning of the pandemic and everything, I have to I try for by three companies, three different companies, three of the largest companies. With all of them, I always have a problem. All the money was not received. And right now, to send money to my country, I was able to send it. For example, for two days, I'm trying to send $200. I sent, as usual, online. They said, your money is delayed. I call and try to say what is going on because there was not dollars in the country. It was not the problem of the of the agency, but the banks or the or the partner that they have to give the money. There's no dollars in the country. This is a problem of the country, but this has been a, an issue sending remittances. Sometimes, if I face that issue on the digital, could you imagine a person who is undocumented that can face those issues? So that's one kind of example. The money sometimes it cannot be available. I face those issues. The other one is my money was withdrawn from my bank account, but it took three or four or six days before the money was dispersed. And when I called the agency, they said, you want your money immediately? Bring cash to the agency. But I said, we are in COVID. I cannot bring cash to the agency. No? They said, oh, but that's the most efficient way. So that's why some of the challenges, I think, that the people are experiencing. I'm telling you a little bit my own experience because this is a, has been happening for me all the time on this time of COVID. So I was telling you that we were, if you can see what happened with the GDP growth and the forecast before and how we were expecting really, really bad situation in some of the main as host countries of migrants and the, or, or the sources of remittances. And as you can see at the beginning with the IMF, 
uh, publish the forecast, they were expecting that, for example, in Germany, the, 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 the decrease was going to be minus 7%, okay? And then when we did the projections, we say, okay, it's going to be very high dip. At the end, we end up with the Germany decreasing only minus 4.9%. So there was a better recovery, and I think it was an important recovery for the countries on, uh, that helped the remittances become resilient. And we have seen this also uh, for the USA and the main, uh, destiny, main sources of remittances. And that's why we can explain, for example, countries that receive money from the United States have been seen resilience because from minus 5.9 that it was expected the GDP growth was going to be decreased in the United States, it decreased only minus 3.5%. Let me pass, okay. Now, from the latest data, if you can see the jobs, when there's a crisis, the jobs fell down for all the people working in that country, but it fell more for the foreign born than the natives. And you can see from this uh, graph that it fell down very, very badly for the foreign born in, in the United States. We started at the same level and then uh, they fell it down, but now it has recovered. However, we have not yet reached the levels of the pre-crisis of COVID. But remittances are increasing now uh, from the United States to the Latin American countries, which are mainly receiving remittances from Mexico. Now, what was the situation in, in, a, in the Europe? As you can see, when the COVID-19 crisis started, there, we started the crisis with levels of, of unemployment higher than the financial crisis uh, in 2000 and higher but not recovered from the financial crisis in 2009. The financial crisis was in 2009, and we can see that the unemployment for the foreign-born was higher than the, for the native-born. We have to, when we look at the data, what happened before 2019, we can see that there was a recovery for the natives in terms of unemployment for the data before the crisis, but for the foreign board, it still has not been reaching the recovery. And that's, that's why in Europe, the migrants also were highly, highly hit by unemployment, especially in Spain and certain countries. Now, we have seen in certain countries a huge increase in remittances. For example, in the case of Pakistan and Bangladesh, we have seen that an increase contrary to what happens happening in other countries where remittances were decreasing in the second quarter. We have seen that for uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan, remittances were increasing. This is not something, uh, this is was something similar to what happened in the financial crisis. In the financial crisis of 2009, also remittances were increasing for these two countries. Now, there were two effects that we were pointed out. Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, put measures, tax incentives to for migrants to send remittances back home. So that what was a, a facilitated the increase in remittances and also was uh, the increase on the cancellation of the hash that people couldn't travel. But instead of that, because they the money that they used to travel, they send remittances. We always said an increase in remittances and when it's the hash, but this time it was a larger increase on the remittances. Now, we have seen also in other countries uh, a shift from cash to digital and from informal to formal channels. However, sometimes this is not being captured in the household surveys. Okay, so what is the outlook? What is the outlook for remittances in 2021? From the numbers that we ran in, we came out in April, we are expecting an increase overall of 2% uh, of for all the countries in 2021. And for uh, Europe and Central Asia, we are uh, expecting an, a recovery, but still a decrease. 
Now, this is a still question mark because the new numbers will come out in October and we can see what is going to really happen with these numbers. For Latin America, we also uh, are expecting to, to continue the increase and we can say that these numbers are going to be in the larger side. Um, one problem that we have with the data is we have an issue with the data. For example, for Latin America, we can have data even until July. We have data up to July for the majority of the country, so we know exactly what is the first seven months of the of how the remittances are coming. And the remittances are coming strongly, has been also creating records for Mexico and in the positive side for the largest of the, of the countries. However, for other countries, like in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa and some cases um, in Europe and Central Asia, the data is still not available. We have, in some cases, data only until March, or we don't have monthly data. And we thought that this is a very important measure to be taken to monitor very closely remittances data monthly in order to have a good grasp of what is going on and how this helps the balance of payments and how it helps the people. Just to give you an example, before the crisis in Somalia, they used to monitor the remittances in several countries every three months. Now they're monitoring every month. And in other countries, I was giving a, give you the example, for example, in El Salvador, they used to monitor the uh, remittances monthly, but now they remove, they watch it, the sending of the remittances weekly, because it's key as a foreign exchange on the time of crisis. However, despite all of this and the, the relevance and importance of remittances, data and remittances is not available so easy. Well, data on migra migration is even not even available, but for remittances, it should be available even monthly. But several countries don't have that data available, and we are going to we are creating an international working group on improving data on remittances as a part of the NOMAD, because several countries, including develop, developed and developing countries, don't have the data up to date, or some report to the central bank using the IMF balance of payments version four, and we are working on version six. And this is not only for countries like um, Somalia that was uh, talking or countries in Africa, some countries also in Europe and some countries like Canada, the, our United States, we don't have that data available on the balance of payments. Now, let's continue. What will happen? Do you think that we will continue doing fine or what are our expectations for the next, um, uh, what are the downside risks for the this year? The risks remain. As we have seen, there's a possible recurrence of COVID-19 there's possibility, it's not any longer a possibility. We saw that in Australia or New Zealand, there is a strain state in some of the lockdown measures, which will have a, a huge impact. We see that the, uh, several countries are imposing measures, not so strict as a lockdown, but uh, because the people are opposing to those measures and people wanted to continue working, but uh, there's a possible recurrence of COVID-19 with the new variants. Now, the shift from digital, uh, from cash to digital, uh, may slow, no, unless uh, access to banking improves. And we have seen some reversion in certain corridors that people, when they want, they can send cash, they prefer to send cash on the digital. But at the same time, digital is so fast and so convenient. So if banks they don't uh, continue improving their services or the remittance service providers, that will happen. Then the, the counter cyclical measures maybe will not continue for long. No? The country cannot continue pro, uh, providing that support. So maybe that could have an impact on the remittances sent by the migrants. The oil prices and exchange rate can be more volatile. We have to look at that. And then um, the sentiment against migrants may turn, may turn more negative. Okay. This is happening in several countries because some of the countries are being hit by crisis. And when there's some crisis, economic crisis in a country and there's competition for their jobs and for the work, the sentiment against migrants are turning a little bit more negative. And just an example on this, talking about the sentiments of the migrants, we have a, we have seen that the, how 
the sentiments to the migrants, uh, according to the Eurobarometer in the European, has become negative after the COVID. We have data until July 20. It was becoming positive before COVID. And now the sentiments has become a little bit negative. And this is also, I don't know if you have seen for Afghanistan, now that there are more inflows, we're expecting large inflows of refugees uh, for different, from different countries and two different countries, and specifically also into Europe. This sentiment is positive in some times, but it's, it's also negative. And I don't know if you have previous discussions, but we have seen, for example, Spain have said that they will receive the uh, Afghanistan people refugees, but this is only going to be very short time because they will like to redistribute into the into Europe for burden the share of the refugee population. And we have seen also some negotiations to send some of the Afghanistan refugees to other countries in Africa or in Latin America. Or I heard something about Colombia also to send them. And this is becoming some negative sentiment against uh, the migrants and the refugees because there's competition for the, uh, as this crisis economy and competition for the jobs. So this could be turned down into a negative sentiment that could impact remittances in the future. Now, I was talking to you a little bit on the macro aspects, but the most tangible and economic development of uh, uh, the most important impact of remittance is for the people and the families. People have been able to get food and have been able to get access to health and education services due to remittances that they receive. This has helped the families to survive in economic crisis, and we have seen this in several countries. And just not too long ago, Italy used to receive a lot of remittances. Now it has become a source of remittances, but Italy used to receive a lot of remittances. So countries develop and become source of or, or, or become also a sender of remittances. Another example how this situation changed, you have seen the case of Venezuela. No, there are around 4 million of Venezuelans around the world now. Venezuela used to be one of the richest countries in Latin America and where a lot of Latin American pop, it was, it was a country that received a lot of a lot of migrants and a lot of remittances were coming from Venezuela to different countries of Latin America, to Peru, to Bolivia, to Ecuador, a lot of the Venezuela. Now what's happening, the situation has changed completely. There's no longer even remittances that can be sent to, to, to Venezuela, no? And then everything has to be sent but, uh, from, different, uh, from different channels, and even they're trying to use cryptocurrency. So remittances help the families, help to survive, but it's important to keep the channels open on the remittances. If there's no remittance service providers, the, the money sent by the families and also the humanitarian money cannot reach them. Let's, let me give you two examples on how this can be impacted. Three examples. The first example is Cuba. Cuba has, uh, has some sanctions and then remittances cannot be sent because it, was, uh, it has been said that a lot of the remittances was sent to finance some of the military expenses. So there's no any way to send remittances now from the United States. Do you know how the money is being sent or how the humanitarian aid is being sent? It's being sent through Spain. So it goes from the United States to Spain and from Spain they can send some of the humanitarian on the goods to Cuba. This has impacted highly the people who receive remittances at this moment. Now, the second case is the current situation of Afghanistan. We have to keep the channels open to send remittances. At this moment, the largest uh, remittance service providers that were operating in Afghanistan have been closed. So at this moment, I don't know if there's some way to send even Hawala system to send money to Afghanistan. I think it's important that remittances sent to humanitarian, to support the humanitarian uh, work there and to support the families has to be the channels open. And the third case was Somalia. Somalia, due to the anti-money laundering regulations, the correspondence banks were closed. So there was a time that there was no bank that was able to send money to Somalia. However, now they have been able to open some of the correspondent banks and then some of the agencies are sending money. So remittances are key, but it's important to keep the channels open. Now, 
I don't know if you have been discussing about the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, but one of the things that is, uh, we have been working is to reduce the cost of sending remittances. Under, under that SDG, the most important thing is we have said for, the, for 2030, remittances have to be reduced to 3%. Now, if you see this table, which has data until the first quarter of 2021, remittances are still almost double for the majority of the regions in the world. So around the world, the global average is 6.4, when in reality it should be 3%. And then uh, in, for the ECA countries, we have uh, remittances at 6.6%. The largest costs are in sub-Saharan Africa, which is very high cost. But I'm going to show you also some of the, some of the impact for, here it is. So as I was saying, the, the cost, 3% is the target, and ECA is in 6.6%, and the war is in 6.4%. So we need to do more to reduce the, the cost of remittances. I have data also here for the, the costs are very high for, uh, for the largest corridors, and then are very high uh, between Switzerland and Albania. I was checking the numbers. This is data on the Q4, but, uh, for, but for the Q1, I checked the numbers also. And then the, the remittances are, uh, are still larger than 10% uh, to send remittances to, to, to from UK, for example, from Czech to Ukraine is 7%. But I saw an increase also from Switzerland to Albania is 10%. No, or from the UK to Albania, 10.15%. The cheapest corridor is from Russia, which is a, have a very good system of sending remittances, so it's 1%. They have achieved already the 3%. But in other corridors, especially also, but I don't know, maybe you can tell me a little bit. I was trying to look for a Slovak, how much is the cost I couldn't find in the, in the database, in remittance service database, so maybe you can see if it's high, it's, it's slow. Uh, it varies, but um, it's important to reduce, and there's a scope and room to reduce the remittance cost to a lower number than instead of having it 9% or 10%, especially when countries are very neighboring. You know? Or from the United Kingdom to Bulgaria or the United Kingdom to Albania, it's not that we are sending uh, the money has not to be so expensive. There's more issues that it needs to be done to reduce the remittance cost. As you, I, I wanted just to give to the contrast how much is the expensive is in Sub-Saharan Africa. You saw that for Eastern and Central Asia, it's around 10%, one of the highest, on 12% on the corridors. But from Turkey to Bulgaria, the cost is 19.91%. So Turkey to Bulgaria corridor is 20%, very similar to the corridors that we see in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which are very high. Now, what it has been done and what it has been requested, what is the policy responses that is needed to uh, support the client governments on the policies? It's very, we have proposed several, uh, several, um, several measures, support migrants, especially when there were stranded migrants, step the cash transfers to migrants, provide access to vaccines, health, education, and support of a lot of the returning migrants, because despite uh, the COVID crisis and due to the crisis, several migrants have returned, several migrants have been deported. So how we can support them in the times of crisis? Support migrants families, also migrants families certain times because they say, oh, this family received remittances, they don't give access to support uh, to social services. So this is important to take into consideration. And we said, let's continue supporting the remittances infrastructure. The remittances infrastructure is important just yes, to improve the collection of high frequency timely data across the different remittances corridors and channels. For example, I don't have the remittances prices across the corridor for the Slovak. This is a data that the World Bank um, collect. But at this moment, I, 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 there's not the data available. Maybe it's available in certain other uh, in other databases. But there's a need to have this database monthly, not um, more frequently. Now, the anti-money laundering and counterfeiter terrorist requirements needs to be simplified. It has to be risk 
uh, in, based on risk, but certain times the anti-money laundering have become very stringent, and this has given uh, that a lot of the correspondent banks have the, the accounts has been closed. So there's no channels and remittance service providers. They don't have correspondent banks to send the money. And the other thing is we need to mitigate the factors to prevent customers or remittance service providers. Um, um, they can access digital remittances, no, and accessing banking accounts. How we can simplify, for example, the access to ID, especially for the undocumented migrants, or how we can make this faster so people who don't have, doesn't have financial literacy can get access to the bank accounts. Just very quickly, I wanted to go uh, into the um, two things that I wanted to, to remind you that the contributions of the migrants of the diaspora is not only remittances. The remittance, as I said at the beginning, is the most tangible form of sending money, but the migrants send also skills and they can contribute with investments. Okay, so for that reason, it's very important the role of the diaspora. And then I think for uh, countries in Eastern and Central Asia, and especially the Slovak Republic, the diaspora can be a key contributor for development. Now, a three message on that very clearly. Uh, I, I will not be able to go uh, across the whole the whole discussion, but um, the, the three key messages: no country know where the diaspora is. I think that this is true for the Slovak Republic. I don't think that there's a database or there's numbers. We have some numbers on the migrant stocks, but remember the diaspora is not only the first generation, it's the second, the third generation, and whoever have a link with the country. And then remember that there are different, um, different waves of diaspora with different uh, measures. The diaspora, I mentioned, contributions are more than remittances, no? is skills. Just to give you an example, in COVID-19 and even in Ebola before, the diaspora doctors have been contributing remotely by virtual links to help the hospitals how to treat the, the, the COVID. Now, there are untapped economic benefits, and it's important to know also the profile of the diaspora to see what they are being able to contribute and why they are working on the different things. So I always talk that, uh, and don't forget that diaspora is not only the skilled diaspora, because the majority of the cases people concentrate on the skill. The unskilled people also uh, contribute. They are located inside and outside the continents. If they're in Europe, it doesn't have to be only on the rich countries. If in their Africa, they have to be in the rich countries in other. And there are people born in other countries. And then, however, it's not possible to have a, a total born. The, the benefits of the diaspora, I wanted to reiterate, not only alleviate the weeks, yes, not only to, to reiterate the, the help on poverty elevation, but it helps on the trade and investment operations, and especially technology transfer. They, pro they, they have an investment. They promote a lot on the investment. And let me go to my last, uh, my last slide, because we are finishing the, the discussion, and I don't think that they, um, we will continue, but the diaspora is eager to contribute. We have seen in all the diaspora of the world, but they will need a very good and conducive business environment, a sound and transparent financial sector, a rapid and efficient core system, and safe and working environment. And let me finish with my last slide. I cannot go into the policies, but to recommend very clearly that Recommendations for the government, we need to improve data on remittances, on remittances and also collection and diaspora, improve the diaspora outreach, try to reach the diaspora, working with the embassies, working on coordination on how to promote trade and investment to do, and the, to, through them and how to stimulate investment. Okay, Because if we can attract the, attract the diaspora, it's important for the economic things. Diaspora contributions are more than remittances. Remittances are key, but the diaspora can contribute more. There are significant and top benefits that we have not been able to, to, to have, and I think it's important to, to, to try to, give, to get them, and the governments need to do more, more in this aspect. I wanted to give you a big thank you for these things, and if there's some questions, happy to respond to you. Over to you. Thanks a lot.